his brutal interviewing technique has left politicians running and A-listers speechless. But are we finally seeing a softer side to Piers Morgan? Well, that clip is uh, taken from this weekend's Life Stories, which features uh, well, Colonel Sir Tom Moore. And uh, Piers joins us now, and it's lovely to see you. Thank um, you. There are some people that even you would find hard to grill. Yeah. I'm assuming that he's one of them. <laughs> he, do you know what? It's my favourite ever Life Stories, because he's not just a national treasure, he's an international treasure, yet six months ago, we'd never heard of him. Mm. He came out of nowhere, and he's just this humble guy who was answering a £100 bet from his son-in-law to walk 100 laps of his garden. And within a few weeks, he'd raised nearly £39 million. And I wanted to do him because I thought, who is this guy? Mm -hmm. We all know him from his mantra, tomorrow will be a better day. He gave us all hope and positivity in a really dark moment for the country. And I thought, I need to know more about him. Mm -hmm. He's hilarious. He's sharp as a whippet. He's got that Yorkshire grit and humour. He's got a resilience about him, born from his war years. He's got everything. Uh, he's a remarkable human being. And I think when people watch the show, it's moving. You know, he sheds tears in the most unexpected moment. He is incredibly open yeah. about his marriages, his life. Uh, his dressing room rider is almost beyond hilarity. We what said did he to ask him, for? What would you like? Jack he, Daniels. He said he wanted a, a can of Coke. He wanted a dairy milk chocolate bar and he wanted six blondes. Uh, and when I laughed, he went, the, the six is a variable number. <laughs> and when I said, would it be fair to say you're a ladies' man, that. Tom? And he said, well, I'd put it like this. I've never been allergic to the girls. Oh, <laughs> I love him Brilliant. Um, and that's how the interview went. Yeah. And do you think you sort of have a, a deeper connection with him, with him, really, because of your family's link to the military? Is there something... Yeah, I said you? that to him. In fact, my grandfather, who was a commando in World War II, he actually served in Burma. Uh, I've got a picture of him there, actually, a very rare picture, because this is a Japanese officer surrendering. Um, and my grandfather may well have been there at the same time. Uh, as Tom. My brothers are serving colonel in the army at the moment in the Royal Welsh. My brother-in-law was a serving colonel. My mum's brother was a, a, an army officer. Uh, my my great-uncle John won the George Medal, actually, wow. for heroism in World War II. So a lot of military in the family. And I, I certainly felt with Tom that the military, to him, has really shaped his yeah. life in many ways. Are they disappointed with you, Piers? <laughs> they look at me as a general, a leader. Do they? Yeah, <laughs> very much, you know, leading the life. If I hadn't... If I'd been in the army, clearly would have gone right to the top. <laughs> uh, no, I think, funny enough, there are... I've always said to my brother, we've often joked about this, but actually leadership is a very widespread thing. When I ran a newspaper, for example, it felt like you're running a bit of an army. It's not as perilous, obviously, as, as serving, but it's, there's similar qualities. And Captain Tom, the great achievement for him mm. was becoming a captain and being able to lead men. And he's a real leader, and he was in the war, outstandingly brave, really risked his life many times, and he led this country in such an unexpected way when we most wanted someone to come through all the misery yeah. and just shine a bit of light and... As he said, tomorrow will be a better day because, you know what, for him, through his 100 years, it usually has been. Yeah, that's very true. Um, it's, it, the programme often gets really emotional, actually. Mm. You sort of... You never know where it's, when it's going to happen. And I think we see that especially with your interview with Vidi Jones. And I know mm. you've interviewed him before, but he's also a good friend of yours. And you've known him and you've watched the, his marriage and, and that relationship and that love story. And, of course, we know the sad ending of mm. that. And this was a difficult one for him to do, wasn't really it? Really heartbreaking. And he wasn't sure whether to do it or not because he knew how emotional it would be. And actually, from the very first minute when we showed a clip mm. of Tanya in the audience for his mm. last Life Stories, he was the first repeat guest because his life has changed so dramatically in the last 10 years. And he just burst into tears and the tears kept flowing. But it was such a raw uh, and powerful interview, such an extraordinary insight into true love, into grief and mm -hmm. how to manage all that. Um, and I felt both with Vinny and with Captain Tom, actually, in very different ways, they show the best of this country in the way that they've dealt with the problems that they've hit and, the, and the try and positively deal with it. Now, I've done this book uh, called Wake Up, which is coming out in a few weeks, and it's really about how we've all been given the wake-up call of our lives. Mm. Uh, with this pandemic and how do we deal with it? What matters to us most? Is it vacuous celebrities or is it health workers and the likes of Captain Tom? You know, family, you look at Vinnie Jones and you think we all got back in touch with our families in many ways through lockdown. 
don't let that go. You know, the, the, the old-fashioned values of people like Captain Tom How's it Tom changed Joe. you, then? Well, I, I felt through it that, um, before it all, it felt like the world was going slightly nuts. I used to say there was a lot on Good Morning Britain, the world's gone nuts, and it was a lot of the kind of culture war stuff that we were all enveloping ourselves in, arguing about everything from gender to race to feminism to masculinity, all these things, but in a very toxic way. You had to be in one camp or the other. Brexit, you had to be extreme left, extreme right, you couldn't be in the middle. Trump, you couldn't be nuanced about him, give him credit, you were either totally in attack for him or totally against him. And it seemed to me democracy is kind of dying if you do that. If you don't allow someone to say to you, hey, I don't agree, and here's why, and you listen, you maybe adapt the way you think. And I think I was part of the noise problem. You know, on Twitter, you can easily, as we all know, get carried away and you get in, into arguments with people and you get more and more entrenched in your position. And actually, as someone like Marcus Rashford showed, the footballer, by being calm and focused and... But you're not, not calm. No. So I've had to learn, I think, through the pandemic... I was not calm at all with the government ministers, but what I learned about myself was you actually get a lot further, as Captain Tom and Marcus Rashford and others have shown, you get a lot further to where you want to get to mm. if actually you're more inclusive, you listen to people, you are a bit calmer. So there's a lesson for me, so there's a you, lesson for you, everybody. Do you think yeah. if you'd been calmer and more inclusive and listened more that, that there wouldn't have been such a long ban on politicians coming on your show? Well, I think... I Listen, in terms of the government ban on Good Morning Britain, it's been 134 days. I don't regret a damn thing I did with those government ministers. I think they have been a total shambles in this pandemic. I've made no secret of it. I think so many more people died than should have died. I think what happened with our care homes is a national disgrace. So I make no apology for holding their feet to the fire. What I think is spectacularly gutless is that these ministers have avoided our show for 134 days. Not just us, Newsnight, Channel 4 News, anywhere they think they may get a rough ride. And now we're seeing, again, very big decisions need to be taken right now. Mm. We're in a perilous moment of this pandemic again. And they refuse to come on and even talk to our viewers and inform and educate them. That's a dereliction of their duty as government ministers. It's completely shameful. They shouldn't be allowed to do it. And last weekend, with the Extinction Rebellion uh, blockade of newspapers, out they all came. Boris Johnson, Matt Hancock, these great pioneers and defenders of free speech. Boris Johnson actually tweeted, we should be held accountable. That's the point of freedom of the press. Really, Boris? Well, why are you hiding in a fridge and not coming on our show? But don't, but don't you think that because... I mean, obviously, you, you, you speak for the nation on gr a great many things. You are extremely forthright and strident when you say it. But we watched you all the way through lockdown. We've, we're going to watch you every morning as we're getting ready on our own. Mm. And you do go for it. And mm. sometimes you don't let them reply. Oh, and look, sometimes I know I probably went a little too far. But I was genuinely angry. I had work colleagues, Kate Garraway's husband... Yeah. In a coma, mm. I had three friends of mine who lost their parents in care homes. I had others who narrowly escaped and nearly died. And I do feel if you were that closely touched by it, mm. with people's lives actually being directly affected and people dying, mm. then it Imagine made me so life. angry, yeah. the, the, in my view, in the way that we mishandled it. And what worries me about the position we're in now is, once again, the government has to make hugely important decisions. Mm. You know, and my message to the young people who may be watching this, please take this seriously. Case numbers are going up sharply. Hospitalizations and deaths are beginning to move up too. Through Europe, we're seeing a similar pattern. We do not want to get back into where we were in March, April. Please take it seriously. One of the, one of the other things in, in the book, and you say here that you perhaps should be more inclusive or you should, you, maybe you shouldn't react quite the way you do, mm. but, but your book, but Wake Up, is actually about the fact that you can't stand being told what to say and what to do. So you, and, and there's a lot more now. Well, no, it's different. I, I would quibble with that. What it's about, really, is I should be entitled to have a view about anything. And you should be entitled to have your view about anything. What I shouldn't be entitled to is to feel so self-righteous about my opinion that yours doesn't count. And, in fact, if you don't agree with me, you have to be shamed, vilified and cancelled and lose your job and have your life destroyed. This is this woke cancel culture mentality, which I think is incredibly dangerous 
for this country and for every other country that allows it to start to dominate public debate. Mm. We've all got to be entitled to have our opinions. This country was built on people having the confidence to have their opinions. I know so many people on television and in public life now terrified of saying anything yep. yeah. because they're all walking on eggshells. One false word, one false opinion that has not been cleared by the woke brigade and bang, and you're out. Wrong. Well, it's time to have that debate and to defend democracy and say the most powerful thing in any democracy is freedom of speech, your ability and mine to disagree with each other vehemently, but at the end of it, say, shake hands, yeah, we both learn have something. A good chat. The, um, we're going to hear more of your opinions because you're sticking around for our news review. With Andrew Neil, I hear. Yep. Yeah. This is like the Thierry Henry and Dennis Burke <laughs> uh, of world <laughs> opinions. Yes, it is. Uh, actually, I, I, it great. Is. I love Andrew Neil. He's, he's one of my, uh, my heroes, actually. Well, we look forward to that. Um, in the meantime, what we are talking about is Piers Morgan's life stories. It continues uh, this Sunday at 8pm and then your book is obviously in a couple of weeks' time. It, it comes out on October the 15th. You can pre-order now. Amazon sales are flying, I'm delighted to tell you, and I know you'll all want to help me out at this difficult time, but <laughs> Captain Tom, Captain Tom Life Stories is one of the greats. Mm. If you like that guy or want to know more about him, it's a real moving tearjerker. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll Thank see you in a bit. See you in a bit. See you in a bit.